I'm very excited to be presenting at this inaugural, inaugural uh, workshop. And I hope that my very brief presentation can bring people back into the story because I am a historian. Um, and so I'm an assistant professor in the history department and I focus on early American and Atlantic world history. And before I talk about the specific theme of a chapter that I'm working on, I want to just give you the broad brushstrokes of the book project that I'm working on so that you can maybe see how it fits into it. So I'm currently working on a book that's called The Jamaica Ladies, Gender, Authority, and Atlantic Slavery. And it studies a place and a group of people that we don't normally associate with early America. But I want to suggest just give you a little bit of a sense of how I think that this place and these people in particular are actually central to that history. So we're talking about a colony that had this kind of volatile cocktail of people making incredible profits. It was very violent, very brutal. Um, and what I want to do today is talk a little bit talk a little bit about how women were a part of this story but set aside the, the brutality and the violence of that project a little bit. Um, so what I show in my research is that women were involved in every aspect of slaveholding. They bought, managed, punished, and even freed slaves. And so they derived considerable benefits by being located in Jamaica. And that's, that's the general overview of what the book is about. Um, but what I want to talk specifically about today is a new chapter that I've just started revising and I've never presented this research before, so you're the pe first people who are hearing about it. And I want to focus on people's intimate relationships. So we know now that Jamaica, very profitable, but kind of nasty place to live. But within this broader framework, what kinds of intimate relationships could people form? Um, what I'm going to argue is that over the course of about 30 or 40 years during the early 18th century, marriage kind of waned in terms of importance in the colony and baptism became more important for people across boundaries of race and slavery. So I'm going to talk about people who had European descent and also people of African descent. So let me start with an example of the kind of people that I'm talking about. One couple, the woman is named Sarah Robinson, the man is John Drinkwater, baptized three illegitimate children together in the 1720s. And they decided, decided to start a family together. We know this because they had three children together, but they had different last names, so they never got married. And my question is why? Um, they weren't impoverished, which might be the obvious answer. On the contrary, by the time that John died in 1745, he'd amassed a fortune of 9,000 pounds. So he would be, I don't know, maybe have $2 million in today's economy. So obviously they could have afforded to get married. They had this lasting relationship, they had several children together, and they also lived in Kingston. And the Kingston at this time was kind of the central hub of the British slave trade and it was the major city in Jamaica, but it was also still pretty small. It was a tightly knit community of a couple of thousand people, and everybody knew each other. So that makes the fact that they didn't get married even more intriguing to me, because you would assume that the social pressure would have been pretty high. Um, and I want to just frame why I think this is so strange with a little bit of the context of marriage in the 18th century more broadly. So in Britain and through many of the other colonies in British America, single women were normally viewed with suspicion. You can see from this picture, um, they're either pitied by their families, treated as dependents, or viewed as being sex sexually disreputable. And so if you just think of any Jane Austen novel that you've ever read, there's always a single woman who's waiting to get married. And while she's single, she just her family just feels kind of sorry for her. Women who had children outside of marriage were not just pitied. 
they were socially ostracized and sometimes legal actions were taken against them. So in England, for example, bastard bearing was treated as a crime. Women could be expelled from their local communities or they could be sent to workhouses to do labor. And I want to stress the fact that these crimes were gendered. They did not target men, right? Men might be required to pay maintenance for the children, but they weren't going to be punished in the same way that women were. And so women really bore the brunt of the social stigma of having children out of wedlock. And this would have been especially true for women who were middling or wealthier, which is exactly the kind of women that I'm studying in this chapter. So if we return to Jamaica with this backdrop in mind, couples like Sarah Robinson and John Drinkwater become a lot more curious. And this is the entry for where the, actually the, the baptism entry, where they're bringing one of their children to be baptized and you can see their names and just know that they aren't married because they have these different surnames. I think that if they had lived in Massachusetts or in Virginia, they would have been socially ostracized, right? The consequences of having this kind of family would have been very different. But in Jamaica, the situation was different. And what I've done is I've looked at all of the parish registers in the island, and what I've found is that this kind of, this kind of relationship was widespread. It was very common. This was not an unusual entry in the parish baptism records. So I've done some math, some calculations, looking at all these parish registers, and determined that one out of every four children in Jamaica had parents who were not married. The numbers where John and Sarah lived in Kingston were even higher. One out of every three children was what we would consider to be illegitimate. Um, and just to give you a sense of how different this is from Britain, the illegitim illegitimacy rates in Britain at the same time ranged between about 0.5 to 5%. So the difference between Jamaica and Britain is dramatic. So what I'm trying to figure out is how do we explain this pattern? How do we explain this phenomena? So the first question is who are these people who are having all these kids and not getting married? And there's no satisfying simple answer to that question. The couples defy racial status, they defy economic status, and occupational status. So when I look at the numbers kind of island-wide, 45% of all of the illegitimate children were born to families that I think were white. Race can get a little complicated in Jamaica, and we can talk about that. But they were white. Um, they could have gotten married. There was no law against it. And a lot of them were quite wealthy. A little over 30% had free mothers of African descent. And about 20% were born to one enslaved mother and normally a uh, free father who was white. These numbers vary by parish, um, and so it's really hard to identify a kind of typical couple that would have illegitimate children and decide not to get married. But the point that I want to impress upon you is that what this tells me is these kinds of relationships were socially acceptable, right? Um, and in fact, they had become attractive to a wide range of people. So now let me try and just think a little bit about why this is. Um, I think, first of all, if we, we turn to enslaved women, the answers are relatively simple for why they would not be getting married and having children out of wedlock. Christian marriage was not necessarily desirable and in most cases not acceptable to most people of African descent and definitely not enslaved people. The only enslaved women who appear in the parish reg reg registers have a white uh, partner. So I think that these children posed a real problem to slave societies, right? Because you need to figure out if they're gonna be free <laughs> or if they're gonna be enslaved. And a lot of colonies had taken steps to solve this problem, right? So places like Virginia, Antigua, and South Carolina 
pass laws against interracial sex, interracial marriage, and they also created laws making it very clear that if children of enslaved women were baptized, this would not free them. Right, so then we have a question of why are they having these children baptized? It's not going to lead to a path to freedom anyway. Um, these laws severely limited the paths to liberty for the majority of the enslaved population in Jamaica. And they certainly took away any protection enslaved women might have from the exploitation or even rape. Interestingly, Jamaica did not pass any laws regulating interracial sex or marriage, uh, which, is, which is curious. And not many people have considered this and how it changes things in the Jamaican context. I think that social censure still played a powerful role in preventing enslaved women and free men from getting married, but they still had long-standing and meaningful relationships. And in fact, these relationships had become so commonplace in Jamaica then when an English minister named William May went there, he ended up serving in Jamaica for 25 years, and I've read a lot of his letters, and he complains a lot about how badly behaved the colonists are, and he focuses on these relationships between free white men and women of African descent. And he even goes so far as to write to the Bishop of London and say, quote, that the, the Speaker of the Colonial Assembly had suggested to the Assembly that people should be encouraged and rewarded for begetting mulattoes and that this was the best way to people the island. So clearly from his perspective and many other observers who go to Jamaica, colonists are violating English norms and in fact the norms that were being established in many other colonies. They started families outside of wedlock and they engaged in relationships with enslaved women. And so this really troubles people like William May, but he also decided to stay on the island. And I think he probably baptized about 1,500 people while he was there. And a few hundred of those people were enslaved, born to enslaved women. So for an ex example, in 1727, he baptized the child of an enslaved woman named Lucy who appeared with her partner, John Bartlett, who was probably white. They had a daughter named Elizabeth Bartlett. And we can see from these kinds of baptisms that John had no compunction about publicly acknowledging his relationship with this enslaved woman. And the baptism actually served as a means of confirming the relationship. And he gives their daughter his last name. So there's a clear recognition of family there, even if they're not married. And to me, this suggests that there's a real level of intimacy and care between the couple. Um, I also want to think for a minute about what this baptism meant to Lucy, the mother. Um, the fact that they couldn't free her didn't make it unimportant, but it was a first step that would mark the child as going on a path toward freedom. Am I out of time? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>